I would like to ask uh, Dr. Bethencourt and Bethencourt to chair the first session for us. Dan, please. Uh, thanks. Good morning. Welcome. I'm uh, proud to uh, be able to uh, participate in this conference for probably my fifth year uh, now coming back and, um, and really look forward to uh, the updates that we have. Uh, this morning we're going to primarily talk about valve surgery and um, um, starting off, uh, Steve Hoff who from uh, Orlando Heart Institute is going to speak, speak about um, the mini thoracotomy approach to mitral valves, which as you know is the um, default approach in Germany for uh, mitral valve repair. And in America, we're not quite there yet. So part of what we're doing at this meeting is uh, getting us to that point. Dan, yeah, thank you. Just be sure that uh, we got things rolling here. So I appreciate the opportunity to come speak with you today. Um, I'm uh, pinch hitting a little bit. Um, so uh, uh, I appreciate the uh, opportunity for uh, that Mahesh has given me to uh, speak with you a little bit about uh, minimum invasive access to mitral and tricuspid valves. Um, as I told Mahesh this morning, um, in the spirit of Master's Week, um, having um, given some of the first talks in the early re-evolution courses on op-cab, mid-cab, hybrid coronary vascularization, and now with the uh, opportunity to speak to you this uh, session about AFib and uh, middle invasive mitral surgery, I'm approaching, I feel like Rory McIlroy, I'm approaching the career grand slam here, I think. So uh, we'll see what next year brings. But um, uh, So I have no pertinent disclosures. Um, we're going to talk a little bit uh, briefly today um, uh, about some of the advantages of approaching the uh, mitral tricuspid and other procedures minimally invasively, um, how we get there, how you get out of there. Um, uh, I've been asked to kind of make this more of a sort of a functional kind of uh, how we do it, uh, the tips and tricks that we use to do this successfully, so that's what we're going to try to do. And we'll talk a little bit at the end about um, results, not only ours, but uh, sort of um, uh, those available in uh, consensus statements and um, uh, and uh, uh, larger trials. So um, according to the SDS database, the most recent um, study that I could uh, find uh, in the late 2000s suggests that actually about 20% of mitral surgery now gets done minimally invasively. Um, so we're getting there. But, um, but I think what you're going to see as the next two, three talks go on is that the, uh, the techniques are so powerful, we believe that if we can try to um, continue to um, improve that number, um, we'll benefit patients in general. Um, access to the, um, uh, to the mitral valve uh, from minimal invasive surgery actually started a lot peristernally. Um, years ago. I think that's largely probably been abandoned. I think a lot of surgeons still use a lower mini sternotomy as their minimal access. Um, uh, as Dan mentioned, I think most um, surgeons that do this now probably employ this right thoracotomy approach, uh, whether they use direct vision or, um, or uh, video access. That's what we'll talk about today. And then you'll hear more from others about port access and robotics that I think uh, you know, may be our direction for the future. The beauty of all of these techniques, though, is um, the direct access that you have to the mitral valve and it's the entirety of its structures. Um, I, I still, I think, am amazed, and I think patients and referring physicians are amazed as well, that you can see the mitral valve and the entirety of its um, uh, structures so much better through a small incision in the chest than you can through a sternotomy. Um, so for us, that's been a big advantage. We'll talk a little bit about, um, uh, again, the tips and tricks for getting there. Arterial cannulation is a, a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, we use ephemeral technique, but there have been some uh, uh, discussions about the potential for morbidity with that. Uh, direct aortic cannulation and axillary cannulation are also available for more anti-grade perfusion. Protection strategies are another um, uh, variable technique, and you'll hear people um, over the span of the morning talk about um, uh, variably using cross clamp and protection strategies, endoaortic uh, occlusion balloons, and cold fibrillation. So. What I'm going to tell you about, the technique that we typically use is a small right anterolateral thoracotomy incision. We use femoral cannulation for carpal tunnel bypass and use cold fibrillatory arrest. This provides uh, excellent direct visualization um, and also allows really standard techniques and instrumentation for uh, surgery. There are a few uh, small modifications that we've used and we'll talk about that. We believe it provides really a minimal physiologic impact to allow uh, intracardiac surgery with um, what you'll see, I believe, is um, uh, equivalent, if not reduced, morbidity mortality. 
So what can you do through the Storchotomy incision? Well, these, this is a list of the things that we've done over the years um, through this access. Obviously, um, you can perform the gambit of mitral valve surgery repair replacement techniques. Similarly, the tricuspid valve, we'll talk about access to the right atrium as well. Um, you can access uh, both atria for, um, as needed for atrial septal defect repairs uh, or mexoma resections. Um, you can do any combination of uh, left atrial or biatrial ablation if you need. Um, we've uh, reported an experience with hybrid laser lead extraction utilizing this technique and a laser for extracting um, uh, leads that uh, can't be managed with bulky um, clot or um, endocarditis um, lesions. And most importantly, you'll see uh, we think it's an extremely powerful technique for reoperation. Um, we've, used, we've also used this technique uh, in a hybrid setting, if you will, uh, for patients with combined valve coronary disease, uh, where we'll um, typically um, uh, use stents to treat non-LED coronary stenoses. If patients have LED disease, we think that's probably the tipping point, and the benefit from a mammary probably moves us to a sternotomy. Um, and then a minimally invasive valve approach. Um, uh, this is particularly powerful in a reoperative setting. Patients who have had previous coronary surgery and may have uh, some residual non-LED disease that can be managed interventionally and that allow us to uh, use a minimally invasive technique for their valve surgery. And again, we think it lowers um, uh, the morbidity and mortality associated with the procedure. So what are the logistics of this right thoracotomy approach? Um, we typically use a single lumen and tracheal tube, simplifies things. If, uh, as we're, before we get uh, on pump, if we need to um, get a better view of the um, uh, right side of the pericardial space will um, uh, go apneic for just a few seconds um, if we need. We use a pacing swan and external zoll pads. We use the pacing swan actually for fibrillation um, and for rate control postoperatively um, and external zoll pads for uh, defibrillation. We use peripheral cannulation, which we'll talk about with a vacuum assisted venous drainage and an anterolateral thoracotomy incision. Again, um, we've used a technique with cold fibrillatory arrest without a, a direct cross clamp or the need for cardioplegia. Um, uh, long instruments and a handheld atrial retractor. But again, these are all uh, sort of techniques that we've used and, um, and uh, only a part of the uh, potential um, uh, gambit. So we'll talk a little bit about each of these in some brief detail. Patient selection, positioning, incisions, um, the logistics of the uh, pump run, retraction, visualization, instruments, uh, and then I think de-airing and right atrial axis, which are a little bit more um, unique for this uh, technique. So patient selection, we think that this is obviously a good um, uh, approach for pretty much any patient, and that's how we approach uh, the majority or the uh, entirety of our mitral practice. But I think it's a particularly powerful technique for those patients who maybe have a um, catastrophic mitral problem and haven't developed the five centimeter left atria that allows you to kind of crawl inside and do what you need to do. So those patients with small left atria or in the reoperative uh, setting, this is a particularly powerful technique. Um, while we've certainly um, done this in all of these, uh, the next group of patients, I think this is probably not the way you want to do your first 10 cases. Um, more than mild uh, aortic valve insufficiency makes it a, a much more difficult to really be able to see the uh, valve well. Um, the obese patient is a bit of a challenge, although uh, we'll talk about, you know, the ability to retract a diaphragm and other things that allow you to manage the right uh, chest space. And previous uh, uh, right um, uh, uh, pleural space procedures um, can make things challenging, but uh, certainly can be overcome. Um, I think it's a really important thing also to mention, uh, and I'll mention it here, the evaluation of femoral vessels. Um, so again, one of the early wraps of um, uh, retrograde perfusion and femoral cannulation uh, in this technique has been the thought that it may increase um, neurologic complications. So we're very careful about evaluating the iliofemoral system to be sure that we're not retroperfusing someone with the you know, grade five uh, aortic disease. And at the very least, you have to yourself feel the femoral vessels and make sure that um, this is something that um, you, know, you can access safely. And we'll, um, with a very low threshold, um, perform CTA on these patients to really evaluate their iliofemoral system to be sure that uh, we can um, retrograde perfuse them safely. We position these patients right side up. We use a rojo bladder, but a roll or a sheets will also do to um, bring their right chest up a bit, and then their right arm kind of gets tucked down along the side of the bed till I you know, full access to the uh, right uh, 
uh, chest. Um, and again, one of the things I'll mention here is, you know, especially in obese patients, this particular patient isn't, but in obese patients, if the diaphragm rides up um, in your way, it's a very easy thing um, once you've made a small thoracotomy incision to put a, a stitch in the barrier of the diaphragm and bring it out through a chest tube uh, site. In fact, I'll show you a picture of that later to really retract that diaphragm down and it really opens up the space terrifically. So again, another um, nice little trick to use um, when you're uh, trying to gain access. It's a more lateral incision. You'll see a couple of other post-op pictures. Um, the, I'm not sure this mark is particularly accurate. Um, it ends up being in and around the fourth inner space. So in men, that skin incision is pretty much over the um, uh, inner space that you um, uh, are, plan to work in. Um, it typically uh, ends up being one of the more horizontal, uh, first horizontal inner spaces rather than a more lateral one as you get further down in the fifth and sixth inner space. Um, for women, often the incision, we make this incision in sort of the submammary crease, and so the incision may be a little bit away from your intended um, uh, uh, inner space access, so sometimes that'll make it a little bit longer, but still a very cosmetically appealing incision for women. So, you know, uh, we've used this variably. I like a nest tech retractor. This is a picture that my partner gave me um, where, you know, he, they like a tufier and basically incision big enough to get a tufier in it. Um, as far as managing the pump, uh, we use an open cut down for femoral access with an open cellular technique with purse strings. Um, uh, we use a, a femoral arterial cannula that varies based on the size of the patient and a, a long um, wire wound venous uh, cannula um, that we place, uh, again, with the cellular technique under uh, TE guidance um, to allow us to have safe access to the right atrium. Vacuum assisted drainage, we use mild hypothermia. This is also another important point. The fibrillation threshold of the human is variable. And one of the things that you want to try to avoid in this situation is early defibrillation. As long as the mitral valve is incompetent, you're fine. But if it's not, you have the potential of ejecting a stroke volume full of CO2 or air out into the patient and things don't go very well then. So um, uh, typically we're cooling to around 30 degrees to be sure that um, uh, the patient doesn't defibrillate spontaneously um, and then warming early. We fibrillate with the pacing, uh, pacing swan and open the left atrium uh, early to avoid uh, uh, LV distension, especially if there's a little bit of AI. And then again, care with rewarming to be sure that we don't um, uh, get warm too soon and, um, and uh, are, unex or are surprised by defibrillation. So again, just standard uh, femoral arterial access and long venous access, um, and that's basically the setup uh, in the groin. Um, from a retraction standpoint, we've talked about you know, retracting the diaphragm briefly with um, sutures. Um, op we open the pericardium anterior of the phrenic and a couple of uh, retraction sutures and posterior pericardium give you great access to the uh, atria. You can use a left atrial lift system. We have a handheld left atrial retractor that you'll see a couple of pictures of that we like. Uh, you can manipulate it around. Um, our assistants have got very good and very patient, thankfully, about um, uh, retracting. Um, what the setup that you'll see here is we use uh, sort of two wire wound suction devices to the pump. One that uh, uh, goes with a CO2 line through a chest tube site and the other, uh, some of us prefer a handheld suction, others use a separate wire wound um, through the mitral valve. So one of those goes into the, uh, into the uh, uh, pulmonary vein and the other goes through the mitral valve and, and that basically allows you great um, uh, suction setup. So, uh, um, so again, this is sort of the, uh, the setup with a uh, um, uh, retractor in the inner space, a chest tube site with uh, one of the wire wound drains um, into the pulmonary veins and a CO2 line uh, running in as well. That's our handheld atrial retractor, um, and we set that up on a stack of towels there to allow less fatigue for our um, assistants, and, um, uh, and, uh, and that's basically the setup right there. That's what it looks like, and so um, now we're poised to pretty much do what we need to do. Um, from an instrumentation standpoint, um, we do uh, utilize, um, uh, as I said, this uh, handheld retractor system. We tend to use longer hardboard instruments, um, and then um, a chit would knot tire for extracorporeal knots, which is another technique that um, um, you know we've gotten fairly fast at. That's a part of the learning curve of this sort of procedure. The surgeon is seated, um, so uh, you know by uh, moving the table, you can make this really a very comfortable. Um, procedure with, a, like I say, a great view of the uh, mitral valve. Standard repair and replacement techniques, I'm not going to really talk to you tell you much about that today. And again, um, uh, extracorporeal knots uh, for either repair or replacement. 
Deering, um, again, is one of those things that I think is um, a, an important um, safety um, uh, topic for getting in and out with this technique. And we do that in steep turn down preposition. We blow CO2 into the field throughout the case, and we'll occasionally um, just put the CO2 in the left atrium just to kind of be sure that whatever um, uh, whatever gas is in the left atrium is CO2 that will dissolve um, quickly as opposed to um, uh, oxygen. I um, uh, had to be a little bit careful about getting all the, blowing that straight into the left ventricle and or getting it right up the aortic valve, but um, uh, we keep, a, uh, oops, sorry, we keep the wire wire vent through the mitral valve um, uh, to keep it incompetent while we're closing and uh, actually a little bit of AI helps and you can actually generate a little bit of AI with that handheld retractor enough to kind of fill the left ventricle and make de-airing uh, better. Um, and, uh, and then basically um, uh, um, uh, kind of remove those drains as we're leaving and then monitor air with transoptilic cardiogram. So right atrial access can be managed in a lot of different ways. We've done this several different ways. Um, the simplest way to do it, um, if you just uh, need to uh, close a um, PFO or something like that, is just advance the femoral cannula into the SVC and open the right atrium and turn the suction up and deal with the air for a bit. Um, and usually that's not a big huge deal and the cannula can be uh, maneuvered around. If you need to, you can manage it as you would manage it transdermally. Put tapes around the SVC, IVC. Um, uh, you can put a separate uh, metal tip cannula in the SVC with the purse string. That's you know, my usual technique transdermally. Um, more commonly what we'll do is put a small wire around venous cannula through the incision up into the SVC and put a tape around it and you've got, uh, and then just pull the uh, uh, femoral cannula back uh, into the IVC and you've got great access um, uh, to the right atrium for as long as you need. Um, so at the end, this is kind of what it ends up with. So this is you know, that submammary incision we were talking about in a, a chest tube uh, site. And you know, this is the incision in the end. So how have we done? Well, um, again, if you look at uh, consensus statements and, um, uh, and uh, uh, look back over the literature, I think that most people will agree that with these minimally invasive techniques you're going to talk about that, that they have at least equivalent, if not somewhat superior mortality and major morbidity, that durability of repair, for instance, is at least as good, if not better. Um, there's uh, almost certainly less bleeding and transfusion and reoperation from that standpoint. We believe there's less low output um, and protection issues when, with this cold fibrillatory technique. Um, all that leads to shorter ICU and hospital stays and a more rapid return to recovery when we're not talking about um, external precautions. Um, uh, I put cosmetic near the end because, to be quite honest, while the patients really like that, I'm not sure that's the reason we're doing this. Um, and I think there certainly has been um, some information back and forth, depending on the site, about cost effectiveness compared to sternotomy or robotic assisted. Um, this is uh, a compilation of uh, our data at Vanderbilt. This is about four or five different surgeons over the span of a little over a decade. That number is about 2,000 now. I've left the institution, but um, again, all these cases are cold fibrillatory arrest with uh, mortal mortality and major morbidity statistics that would stand up against the STS database and I think most trials that are um, uh, published. Um, this is a uh, paper that uh, we published in the annals uh, a couple of years ago that actually looked at high um, uh, risk patients. Um, it looked at a small subset of uh, our um, experience uh, with patients who had an STS predicted mortality greater than or equal to 10%. And again, in those patients where the observed or the expected uh, predicted mortality was close to 20%, uh, the observed mortality rate was 4% and the uh, mo major morbidity rate was about the same as what you saw in that previous slide. So again, we think that we, you can use this, as, it is particularly powerful, this technique, um, as the patients get sicker and sicker. So in summary then, I think what we would say is minimally invasive mitral and tricuspid surgery with direct vision and cold fibrillation is a safe and effective alternative. Um, multiple procedures can be formed with this technique. Standard repair and replacement techniques can be um, used based on the surgeon's preference and it's particularly powerful uh, as the patients become more challenging. So that's all I had to say. Thank you very much for the opportunity and um, be happy to answer questions later. <laughs>